this paper is to, um, I thought, given that it was a, a postgraduate conference, um, that I would uh, give a talk around a pedagogical question. Um, I'm often asked about the relationship between Deleuze and his various source materials, and this is one of the questions that, uh, as a supervisor of PhD projects, I get asked a lot, um, and also just by various people who email me. Uh, so philosophical materials, scientific materials, creative materials, historical, archaeological, uh, and so on. Um, usually by students wanting to know how much of that vast and utterly eclectic background reading they ought to do. The answer I generally give is the rather ambiguous one that sometimes it can help, but sometimes it doesn't. I'm generally ambivalent about the idea that reading everything Deleuze himself supposedly read will provide an answer to the larger question of what he himself meant in his writing, uh, and I'll try to say why. Now, I should just clarify when I say supposedly read, I was talking to Patricia about this earlier on, but one of the things that has come out uh, more recently is that in the aftermath of Antietipus and before the writing of A Thousand Plateaus. This is a moment when Deleuze and Guattari are, are famous, um, but also they're teaching together at Vincennes, and loads of students come to the... If you've seen the, some of the videos on YouTube and so forth, you see that the seminar rooms are jam-packed. I mean, there literally is people sitting right next to Deleuze sort of looking at his notes and that sort of thing. Um, but the students are bringing stuff to them and bringing big chunks of text from all kinds of places and saying, you've got to read this, you've got to read this. Who knows how much of that stuff Deleuze actually read, but certainly there's a kind of collective project going on in producing that book, uh, which, for me, renders questionable and makes it problematic uh, in the sense of something that we should think about, the nature of his relationship to this material. Okay. Now, first, I think we need to take seriously Deleuze's differentiation between philosophical, scientific and artistic discourses in What is Philosophy. Now it's quite interesting that the final book that they write together is What is Philosophy, in which almost, I think deliberately, they set out a program of how one should read the, all the previous books. And this book kind of comes at the end and saying, OK, look, we've written all this crazy stuff, but if you follow this systematic method, you can actually make sense of it. So I've always thought that you should read What is Philosophy as a kind of reader's guide to all the prior material. And the first thing that they say, which I think is critical, is that they distinguish quite rigorously between scientific discourse, artistic discourse, and um, philosophical discourse. Now, I'm using discourse in the sort of Foucauldian sense as a kind of shorthand here. It's very clear that he does not regard these discourses to be interchangeable. He allows that they can interfere with one another productively, but he rules out their interchange. Scientists produce reference, not concepts. The actual word Deleuze uses is functive, but the function of a functive is to provide reference, so I'm going to call them reference rather than functives because it's, I think, a, a fairly silly word. Um, so scientists produce reference, not concepts. Artists produce affects and percepts, not concepts. Only philosophers produce concepts, and while these may borrow from reference and from percepts and affects and so on, they are not the same thing. So, for example, when Delunder uses science to ground Deleuze's ontology, he transforms concepts into reference, which is precisely not what Deleuze himself wanted. By the same token, when various readers of Deleuze assume that Artaud is the source of the concept of the body that organs, they mistake a percept for a concept and forget that Deleuze defined artistic works as pre-philosophical. Second, taking this into account, what we have to try to determine is just what is the difference between a concept and a referent and a percept, or rather, since in a way we know the difference, what the question then is what work goes on in transforming the latter, reference and percepts, into the former, namely concepts. To begin with, there has to be a kind of subtraction. Concepts are less referential than reference. Their ontology is less realist, to use Delunder's term. Concepts are less perceptive than percepts. But in taking away, they must also perform an addition. So concepts might be less referential than reference, but they are more able to deal with complexity because they aren't constrained by the same rules of empirical proof. 
Concepts might be less perceptive than percepts, but in a way they enable us to see more than percepts do because they aren't constrained by the limits of the material one has to work with in art. So what I'm trying to say is they're not the same thing and what we have to do in trying to figure out how to work out the relationship is to look at the process of transformation of one into the other. Now in a paper um, that will come out in a book later this year, I believe, um, by a Belgian scholar by the name of Annaline Macheline, um, she writes and puzzles, I think, quite fruitfully about the relationship between Deleuze and D.H. Lawrence. Now, without specifically formulating it as a question, she calls our attention to the problematic way in which Deleuze deals with Lawrence. As she points out, Deleuze is simultaneously a close, careful, and obviously knowledgeable reader of Lawrence, or well, then again, he was married to somebody who was a close and attentive reader of Lawrence. Um, so again, we don't know how attentive he was. Um, as well as highly selective and subtly distorting and even a negligent reader of Lawrence. He not only ignores the great novels, uh, Sons and Lovers, Women in Love, The Rainbow, uh, and Lady Chatterley's Lover. He also ignores Lawrence's, uh, and I quote here, misogynistic attacks on, on modern women and his peculiar ideas on the education of children. He favours instead the critical and psychological work such as Psychoanalysis and the Unconscious and its sequel, Fantasia of the Con Unconscious. He looks at studies in classical American literature and more distantly, the essays in the posthumous collection Phoenix. He makes occasional mention of minor novels, minor novels like Aaron's Rod and novellas such as The Plumed Serpent, but as Macheline rightly observes, these references are always ambiguous in their intent and purpose. For the most part, Deleuze simply extracts resonant catchphrases, slogans and taglines like The Dirty Little Secret from Lawrence rather than fully formed ideas or concepts. Perhaps not surprisingly, Deleuze's principal interest in Lawrence seems to derive from Lawrence's potential to be positioned as one of Spinoza's four great disciples, which also includes Kafka, Nietzsche and Artaud. Now, Macheline's critique of Deleuze's treatment of Lawrence directs us to a question that reaches well beyond the specific case. It raises the question of his relation to his source materials in general, be they literary, historical, philosophical or scientific. And as I've suggested, it's an, an issue that extends to all of Deleuze and Guattari's concepts. For instance, what should I read if I want to understand the rhizome more fully? A plant biology textbook? Um, what about stratification? Should I read a geology textbook? Nomadology? Should I read a history of the desert tribes? And so on. And I kid you not, I have been to conference papers where um, a PhD student has stood up and said that she was working on the rhizome in order to understand it fully. She'd spent the previous six months reading biology. And I had to say to her, wouldn't you have been better off reading Deleuze for the past six months? Uh, and she just looked quite stunned and thought that was a ridiculous thing to say. So I, do, I, I encounter this a lot, and it is to me a very interesting situation where in order to understand Deleuze or to kind of come to grips with what is obviously difficult material, people keep looking for the master text behind the text that will en enable you to decode it all. And I guess what I'm saying is it's not the biology textbook that's not going to do it for you. You're not going to get the answer that way. Now, in order to pursue this question, I'm going to take as a test concept uh, one of the more notorious, namely the body without organs, which appears to have been inspired by the three discourses. So, by literature, from Artaud, by philosophy, uh, from Spinoza, and by science, uh, in the form of Weissmann. Now, the body without organs will, via a circuitous route, uh, through Artaud and Carroll, take us to Lawrence and Freud. And here I'm just going to state baldly what I think that... Um, many of you might suspect anyway, namely that Lawrence provides Deleuze with a suitably anti-psychoanalytic rhetoric with which to disguise, or at least estrange, a powerful engagement with an enemy, namely Freud. But then, Deleuze never said he wanted to, and as if he could, repudiate Freud. His project has always been to lead psychoanalysis to the point of autocritique and thereby re-engineer it from the inside. Now, Lawrence is essential to this project, uh, which in Frederick Jameson's terms, um, should be described as fundamentally modernist because like the many great modernist artists Deleuze is inspired by, namely Artaud, Beckett, Joyce, Kafka, Clay and so on, he conceives of a mental life that is richer and stranger than Freud's ultimately quite normative concept of the life of the mind. Now Lawrence's critique of psychoanalysis gestures in the direction of what uh, Deleuze and Guattari refer to as non-human sex, which they attribute to Marx. Now, Deleuze makes an explicit link between Lawrence and Artaud in the very title of his essay on, on Lawrence, To Have Done With Judgment, which borrows from Artaud. 
He also attributes to Lawrence an explicit role in making visible to us what the body that organs looks like, and I quote here, Lawrence paints the pictures of such a body with the sun and the moon as its poles, with its sections and its plexuses, end of quote. Lawrence's characters, too, seem to Deleuze to be formed in a way that gives life to this concept as well. And again, I quote, Lawrence ceaselessly describes bodies that are organically defective or unattractive, like the fat, retired Torridor or the skinny, oily Mexican general, but that are nonetheless traversed by this intense vitality that defies organs and undoes their organisation. But as exciting and as evocative as these observations are, it is not immediately clear how they help us to understand the concept of the body that organs in an analytic rather than a descriptive sense. And I guess that's the point that I want to make, is that there's a lot of stuff within Deleuze which seems to function, at least in the secondary criticism, in a descriptive fashion rather than an analytic fashion. Sort of People say, well, this looks like a body that organs, but really what they're doing is describing what it looks like rather than using it in an analytic fashion. So in a way, that's the question for us, is how do we turn something that begins as descriptive into something that can function as analytical. <laughs> now, while it might seem obvious that the answer to this particular difficulty is simply to go back to the original sources and read Artaud or Lawrence for ourselves, we are effectively barred from doing so by Deleuze and Guattari's theorisation of how philosophy works, uh, as it's laid down in What is Philosophy?, the central implication of this work is that ideas, concepts and models drawn from other sources do not retain their original meaning once they are incorporated into another thinker's work. Of course, we can and should read Arto and Lawrence for ourselves, and Deleuze and Guattari constantly urge us to do so, but we can't then treat their work as though it supplied a missing referent for Deleuze and Guattari's work like some hidden master code or pass key. And this is made explicit in the discussion of the plane of imminence, which is effectively a sense regime. It is the atmosphere or environment, i.e. the set of conditions under which a concept presupposing it makes sense, unique to each philosopher in which a concept is able to function. So philosophers can coexist on the same plane and therefore share concepts, but great philosophers, and is not Deleuze a great philosopher, are defined by the originality of the planes of imminence that they institute. The problem becomes more acute when we move outside of philosophy because art doesn't create a plane of imminence, it creates a plane of composition. Science doesn't create a plane of imminence either, it creates a plane of reference. Thus, any concepts philosophy takes from these non-philosophical sources automatically undergo a radical transformation when they are brought into their new environment. I mean, if you wanted an image of this, you sort of have to think of these three planes as being like three planes which have space is filled with different gases. And if you're in the philosophy plane, you can sort of stand there and you can breathe the air just fine, but you walk into the science room and there's no oxygen, and if you don't have your oxygen suit on, you expire. So in order to move from one plane to the other plane, you have to prepare yourself in a different way and treat them as quite different. So if we cannot read Artaud or Lawrence as a reference, then how can we read them? Now, my answer, which is drawn directly from Deleuze, is that we should read his sources as he does, namely clinically. That is, we should read the work of artists like Artaud and Lawrence as symptomatologists, specifically of mental illnesses. In other words, the body that organs is a symptom. That is, its first and proper meaning, and we need to be guided by this fact in our analyses of its subsequent permutations in Deleuze and Guattari's work. Now, it is doubtless no coincidence that the concept of the body that organs, which, first, which Deleuze first used in The Logic of Sense, published in 1969, is one of the concepts which drew Guattari to Deleuze. He says so in interviews. He says, I was drawn to Deleuze because I wanted to learn more about this concept of body with organs. I wanted to use these kinds of ideas. Ironically, in a later interview, Deleuze said that he and Guattari never really agreed on what that term actually meant. So in other words, you don't have a consistent meaning within the text or even between the people using the text, uh, which is also making things difficult for you. Now, Guattari evidently saw something in the concept of the body that organs which articulated better, presumably, than he had been able to do himself, something he saw as crucial in understanding the experience of schizophrenics that had hitherto been overlooked in both clinical and critical discourse. In their subsequent collaborative work, one senses that Guattari brought his clinical experience to bear to confirm Deleuze's original critical insight. Now, two observations can be called upon here to substantiate this intuition. First of all, although the concept becomes much more complicated in the work Deleuze and Guattari did together, it doesn't change its meaning. Now, this is a kind of a radical statement, and there are many people who would not agree with that, who would want to say that it, it does change its meaning, so it's something we ought to uh, argue about. 
Second of all, and to my mind this is decisive, in his 1975 entry on schizophrenia for the Encyclopedia Universal, Universalis, uh, Deleuze treats the concept in a very clinical fashion. That is to say, clinical more in Guattari's therapeutic sense of the term than in his own hermeneutic or literary sense. And this, in effect, squares the circle of Deleuze's thinking on the body of that organs because his first presentation of the concept in the logic of sense was very much of the hermeneutic variety uh, of clinical thinking. In the different ways, both pieces confirm and, and conform to the more general idea of the clinical Deleuze elaborated in his early work on Massoc, which proposed to bring the medical and literary together in order to form a new relationship of mutual learning. Read together, then, these two pieces which anticipate and at the same time recollect the publication of Antiedipus make it clear that the body of that organ should be understood as a condition, something that affects the psychical apparatus. What has to be decided is whether it does so from the inside or the outside, rather than a constitutive feature of it. The fact that no psychical apparatus is considered free of its affect shouldn't deter us from seeing the essentially secondary nature of it. Indeed, if we do not take note of this, we cannot grasp what should perhaps be deemed its most important tray, namely its uncanny ability to rise up and fall back on the operations of the unconscious, or what Deleuze and Guattari refer to as desiring production, and make it seem that it is the true source of its productivity. Now, the remarkable thing about the body without organs debut in the logic of sense is that it is basically unmarked, appearing first in a mere parenthesis, its future importance in Deleuze's work is not at all in evidence. In fact, at this point, it could even be said that it doesn't really amount to a genuine concept. It is more the description of a symptom or a condition. Although it will in due course become a fully-fledged concept, it is important to keep sight of its pre-philosophical origins. My implication is that Deleuze doesn't take the body of that organs from Artaud as a ready-made concept. It only becomes a concept in his own work. Therefore, strictly speaking, one cannot use Artaud as a point of reference for this concept if by that one means his work functions as it's signified. The body of that organs crops up, as it were, in the midst of a comparative discussion of the differences between Lewis Carroll and Artaud. Deleuze's question is this. Is the nonsense of the one the same as the nonsense of the other? Are Carroll's made-up words, his boojums, his jabberwocks and snarks, the same as Artaud's breath words, his howl words? his ratataras, and so on. And Deleuze thinks not. He says, A little girl may sing pimp and canal, and an artist may write frumious, and a schizophrenic may utter perspendicatious. But we have no reason to believe that the problem is the same in all these cases, and the results are analogous. The works of the little girl, the poet, and the schizophrenic are not organised in the same way. Their sense regime is different in each case. Artaud's attempt at translating Carol's Jabberwocky, a poem he professed to loathe because of its English snobbery and prudish fecality, is in an indicative case in point. At first, Deleuze says, looking only at the two opening stanzas, we have the impression that Artaud's translation is in conformity with the rules of translation espoused and adhered to by Carol's recognised French translators. But beginning with the last word of the second line from the third line onward, a sliding is produced and even a creative central collapse, causing us to be in another world and in an entirely different language. With horror, we recognise it easily. It is the language of schizophrenia. Carroll's language is a language of the surface, where Artaud's language is a language of the depth. Uh, and as Deleuze puts it in a short piece on Carroll, included in Essays Critical and Clinical, it is not that surface has less nonsense than depth, but it is not the same nonsense. Now, one of the things I'm trying to get across here is that and what seems not to be recognised with Deleuze, is that he actually is very much a formalist. He's always prepared to say that there is a definite distinction between this thing and that thing. And in other words, that's how his philosophy proceeds, by trying to differentiate. And if we lose sight of that, then we really fail to understand what Deleuze is trying to do. So what does Deleuze mean by this? Well, surface is what protects us. The non it's what protects the non-schizophrenics from death, which, as Deleuze puts it, is known to any schizophrenic who lives it as well in his or own manner. Death is the opposite of surface, but it is not hidden beneath the surface, not something constantly lurking below the surface in a way the unconscious is sometimes depicted. It is rather its end. Death is our model and image of death, Deleuze and Guattari argue. As the authors of horror stories have understood so well, it is not death that serves as the model for catatonia, it is the catatonic schizophrenic that gives its model to death. But it is not just a matter of horror stories, fearful images snatched from the pages of Poe and Lovecraft, 
or the reels of Craven and Romero, which we can consign to the dustbin of the imaginary, these images are only affect us because they recollect the fact that the experience of death is a common occurrence in the unconscious. Uh, and this is what they say in Antiedipus. Death is what is felt in every feeling, what never ceases and never finishes happening in every becoming, in the becoming another sex, the becoming God, the becoming a race, forming zones of intensity on the body that organs. Becoming is Deleuze and Guattari's term then for the disorienting experience of delirium, which is the experience of the real for itself, the feeling for which no words are finally or fully adequate. The wolf man feels he's becoming a wolf, although he knows he, knows he isn't. So delirium isn't a loss of reality, as it is sometimes described in psychoanalysis, but rather an excess of reality, a reality in which anything is possible. The real is not impossible. On the contrary, within the real, everything is possible. Everything becomes possible. Delirium is reality experienced in its full intensity, and we should understand intensity in its formal logical sense. The Deleuzean concept of intensity is derived from intention um, rather than intense, the implication being that delirium is a power of selection from which there are no corresponding properties that could serve to explain it in extension. In other words, the feeling of being a wolf with no fangs or no fur. Now, this is why the body that organs, i.e. the schizophrenic state, is described by Deleuze and Guattari as being like an egg. Just as there is nothing about an egg to suggest either where it came from or what it will become, so the schizophrenic is gripped by an inexorable feeling of inner change for which there is neither an obvious point of origin or a clear sense of destination. More exactly, it is a feeling that can only be sensed and not put into words, and this is something we have all experienced, the vertiginous power of thought itself. Now here we can see more fully why Jameson should want to describe Deleuze as a modernist, for it is precisely in this realm of that which can only be sensed that modernism finds its essential inspiration for its concepts of the new. The lesson learned by all the avatars of modernism, especially those who would in due course become prophets of post-modernity, like Ehab Hassan, Jean-François Lyotard and so on, is that the radically new can only stem from that which is by definition ineffable. But as Jameson argues, this is what finally renders modernist politics of Deleuze and Leotard's variety aesthetic and therefore inert or unrealisable. This critique of Deleuze has lately been reiterated by Peter Howard, who claims that Deleuze doesn't live up to Marx's dictum that the point of doing philosophy is to change the world, not merely to understand it. Now, this is not the place to mount a uh, defence of Deleuze, but I think it, it suffices to say that the claim fails to perceive the extent to which Deleuze's philosophy fulfils Marx's other dictum that to be radical is to grasp things by the root, where the root is man himself. Could we not say this is the meaning behind Deleuze and Guattari's valorisation of the rhizome? Returning to the discussion at hand, though, we can say the root is the depth of man, the depth of thought. It is, however, a depth that cannot coexist in the same place as surface. Depth is what one falls into when the surface comes undone. When this happens, when the ragged rent in the fabric of the sky appears, the frontier between propositions and things vanish and the body loses its protective shell and becomes a kind of sieve. And I'll quote briefly here from The Logic of Sense. The consequence of this is that the entire body is no longer anything but depth. It carries along and snaps up everything into this gaping depth which represents a fundamental involution. Everything is body and corporeal. Everything is a mixture of bodies and inside the body interlocking and penetration. The effects of this rupture in, this, in the usually taut frontier between propositions and things are abrupt, brutal and terrifying. The first casualty is meaning, or what Deleuze defines more pragmatically, as the power to draw together or to express an incorporeal effect distinct from the actions and passions of the body, and an ideation, ideational event distinct from its present realisation. So loss of meaning, as it is described here in its schizophrenic manifestation, should not be confused with a neuro neurotic inability to decide the meaning of things. It is more devastating than that. Um, sorry, uh, more devastating than the, the situation of meaning loss that Lacan describes in his account of schizophrenia, which, as Jameson summarises, um, focuses on the loss of the ability to connect signifiers with the result that the signifying chain uh, connecting all signifiers to one another breaks down, and meaning is reduced to a rubble of distinct and unrelated signifiers. It is more devastating because the result of the schizophrenic meaning loss is not so much the loss of connection between signifiers, but the loss of the protective ability to stop connections from forming. Moreover, the result of schizophrenic meaning loss is anything but the inert or static state of a wretched pile of rubble. When words lose their meaning, they crumble into a their phonetic elements, 
and it is as though their protective sheath has been stripped away to reveal a cluster of highly mobile and aggressive acting razor blades. And I quote again here from The Logic of Sense. The moment that the maternal language is stripped of its sense, its phonetic elements become singularly wounding. The word no longer expresses an attribute of the state of affairs. Its fragment, merged with unbearable sonorous qualities, invade the body where they form a mixture and a new state of affairs, as if they themselves were a noisy, poisonous food and canned excrement. Now, under this kind of pressure, the schizophrenic body is unable to hold it together. It becomes a sieve through which the unbearable particles of words and sounds flow unimpeded. It fragments, it fragments into parts which then form new relations with the invading particles, giving rise to all kinds of monstrosities. It disintegrates, the bonds become particles and turn inwards and the relations of attraction give way to relations of uh, repulsion. So in other words, what we have is the opposite of the psychoanalytic account of schizophrenia is that the relations between signifiers fall apart and therefore you have meaning loss in the sense that you can't make meanings. What Deleuze is saying is, in fact, the opposite happens. What you now have is the, is the loss of the ability to stop making connections, and therefore the experience of paranoia or whatever is actually the, the experience of too many connections. Everything you see somehow begins to seem connected. And so, in fact, what you have to explain is not the, the, the loss of connections, but rather the loss of the ability to stop making connections. So the schizophrenic responds to the threat posed by the presence of what Deleuze calls naked words, not by trying to recover the meaning of things and somehow restore them to their clothed status, impossible in any case under the conditions of its regime, but by trying to destroy the words themselves. So this then is the difference between what psychoanalysis is talking about, which is refers to neuroses, in which the idea is that if you can restore the meaning to words, you can then bring neuroses under control. What Deleuze is saying is with schizophrenia this does not work because that's not the problem. The problem is rather that the words themselves have become somehow uh, tormenting and so what the, the schizo schizophrenic has to try to figure out is how to stop them from being wounding. And this Deleuze suggests is the function of the breath words and the how words. They transform or better transmute and transvalue in Nietzsche's sense the literal syllabic and phonetic values of words into tonic values. To these values, and this I'm quoting again, a glorious body corresponds, being a new dimension of the schizophrenic body, an organism without parts, which operates entirely by insufflation, respiration, evaporation, and fluid transmission. And, and here's the infamous parenthesis. The superior body or body without organs of Antonin Artaud. The schizophrenic thus has two bodies, and this is the important point here. One that is porous, friable, and scattered, and another that is smooth, steely, and bonded. The one a body in a state of collapse, the other a body in a state of suspended animation. Both bodies are the product of schizophrenia. The one an impassioned, suffering body, the other a body curled up in a defensive posture with its mouth, ears, eyes, nose and anus shut tight, trying to cure itself or at least defend itself against the onslaught of word particles. Now Deleuze finds an equally fascinating variation of this uh, felt urgency to destroy words in the work of Louis Wolfson, an American schizophrenic who wrote in French out of a kind of pathological horror of the mother tongue. His procedure is as follows. Given a word from the maternal language, he looks for a foreign word with a similar meaning that has common sounds or phonemes, preferably in French, German, Russian or Hebrew, the four principal languages studied by the author. For example, where in English will be translated as vo, here, u, isi, or better yet as vo, here. Tree will be produced ter, which phonetically becomes der and leads to the Russian derevo. Wolfson guards himself against words by performing an endless labour of transformation on them. He is unable to ignore what he doesn't want to hear or else choose simply to put it out of his mind. Words are so many nails and screws that bite into his flesh, clawing away at him until he finds the means of transmuting them into something else, a flow of breath sounds. When that fails, he retreats to his body without organs by jacking into his homemade prototype of the Walkman, which he claims to have invented, um, fabricated from a stethoscope plugged into a portable tape deck. So the schizophrenic ha has two bodies. Uh, one is composed of organ machines and the other body is organless, neither one of which refers to the actual body or an image of the actual body. And this is crucial. You have a lot of people wanted to try to connect it to the actual body. It, ha it cannot be that. 
As the example of the language student given above uh, readily attest, the schizophrenic is torn between the need to construct elaborate procedures to deal practically and on a case-by-case -case basis with the ceaseless torments of reality itself and the almost irrepressible desire to stop up the years and shut out the world altogether and have done with its impositions and demands. Either the mother tongue must be converted as rapidly as possible into another language or else it has to be drowned out with music piped directly to the ears. The schizophrenic oscillates between the decomposed uh, or machinic body, which is plugged into machines, traversed by machines, and has for all intents and purposes become a machine, though never just one machine, such as the language student's translation machine, with its elaborate formulas for converting words into sounds, and the stop it up organless body that Deleuze uh, equates with an egg. Now, Bruno Bettelheim's case study of little Joey is exemplary in this respect too. He has eating machines, he has defecating machines, sleeping machines, all of which require power to work properly. So before being able to eat, shit or uh, sleep, Joey is obliged to make sure all the circuits of his machines are alive and intact. Um, essentially, the, the schizophrenic is a functional machine making use of leftover elements that no longer function in any context. But when these machines break down or their demands become unbearable, Joey falls into a catastonic state. Uh, as the frontispiece of Antiedipus, uh, Richard Lindner's um, bo Boy with a Machine, provides a pictorial representation of this dual state of being, the boy in question is at once a bloated, organless body lost in its own reality and an organ machine hooked up to an infernal machine which seems to, to somehow be empowering. So the organless body is a stationary motor giving life and power to its opposite number and at the same time resisting and repelling the little organ machines which swarm across its surface like so many bacilli. Um, and I quote again, if we think of the organless body as a solid egg, it follows that beneath the organisation that it will assume that will develop, the egg does not present itself as an undifferentiated milieu. It's traversed by axes and gradients, by poles and potentials, by thresholds and zones, destined later to produce one or another organic pack. Now, Keith Ansel Pearson insists that the image of the egg is adapted from the neo-Darwinist August Weissmann's theory of germinal life. But in the logic of sense, at least, no such scientific connection exists or is uh, discussed. In fact, Humpty Dumpty is given as the source of the egg image for this gloriously smooth body. What other reason, Deleuze asked, did Artaud have for confronting this text? In other words, that's the connection between Carol and Artaud, that Artaud felt some kind of instinctive response to Humpty Dumpty. He saw something in that that, that prompted him to think of the body without organs. There are no grounds to suppose that Deleuze does not also draw on Weissmann, providing we resist the temptation to use the supposition to convert a symptom into a referent. The point to bear in mind here is that the body that organs in, is only one aspect of the schizophrenic body, and as important as it is, it doesn't act alone. As Deleuze's discussion of Artaud makes clear, for every Humpty Dumpty there is an Alice, for every Alice a Humpty Dumpty, a body sieve and a glorious body. Clinically speaking, the two bodies antagonise one another. Every coupling of machines, every production of a machine, every sound of a machine running becomes unbearable to the body that organs. Beneath its organs, it senses there are larvae and loathsome worms and a god at work messing it all up, strangling it by organising it. So what the body that organs objects to, what it finds unendurable, is the attempt to organise it made by the organ machines or what are elsewhere termed uh, desiring machines or abstract machines. The constant pressure of having to translate English words into German or French, together with the pain of failure, compels the student of languages to stop at his ears and retreat to a zone where no words can reach him. Little Joey, too, succumbs to a catatonic exhaustion brought on by the relentless need to control his environment with an array of regulating machines, which um, Bettelheim thought he could cure him of by simply taking the machines away. And, of course, Joey goes mental at that point in the uh, non-clinical sense of screaming and raving. So they stop taking the machines away from him, but when the machines kind of break down, because they're just made from bits of cardboard and tape or whatever, they don't allow him to replace the machines. So he has to make do with fewer and fewer machines. And what they discovered is eventually he, he didn't have any of these machines left, and yet he could still every night get himself into bed and strap in the machine that only he could see. And, and he didn't need the cardboard replicas of them anymore anyway. So from that point of view, Bettelheim's strategy was obviously a complete failure. It made no difference to how Joey himself continued to act. As Deleuze and Guattari argue throughout their work, the body that organs is often a product of therapy. The psychoanalyst's inability to hear what they are told, it's not daddy, it's a wolf, and the psychiatrist's fetish for physical therapy conspire to send the schizophrenic into a black hole from which there is no return. 
Ato is much cited description of a body that has renounced all its organs so as to have done with the judgment of God should be seen in precisely this light. It describes the exhausted, exasperated, dispirited, essentially hopeless state of the schizophrenic who has opted for silence and stillness rather than put up with any further incursions on its glorious self. I mean, Arto somewhere defines madness as the decision to simply stay with your own thoughts regardless of what other people say, and then, you know, regardless. Uh, and I think, that in a sense, that's what's going on here. The schizophrenic decides that, you know, what they are seeing is what is true and everything else can just be ignored. Now we come to what is, to my mind, one of the most surprising connections to a prior source one can find anywhere in Deleuze's work. And here I quote from Antiedipus. In order to resist organ machines, the body that organs presents its smooth, slippery, opaque, taut surface as a barrier. In order to resist link-connected and interrupted flows, it sets up a counterflow of amorphous, undifferentiated fluid. And here's underline this word, fluid. In order to resist using words composed of articulated phonetic units, it utters only gasps and cries that are sheer, unarticulated blocks of sound. We are of the opinion that what is ordinarily referred to as primary repression means precisely that. It is not a counter-cathexis, but rather this repulsion of desiring machines by the body without organs. So in other words, what you have then is a redefinition of Freud's notion of repression, connecting it directly to the body without organs. So now, finally, we have the means of turning the body without organs into a usable analytic concept. The relationship between organ machines and the organless body takes on an analytic character once cast in its proper light as a rewriting of Freud. Now, I'm mindful of the fact that this is something of a heretical claim, perhaps even more heretical than claiming Deleuze's work also contains a dialectic, um, which I'm not going to go into. Um, but is not the relation between unconscious desire and preconscious pre interest described in Antiedipus precisely dialectical in as much as the problem they pose for contemporary politics is that it is possible and frequently happens that desire desires against interest. So let me try to briefly justify this connection with Freud. As is well known, uh, in Freud's system, the ego is the site and the agency of repression. What we see in the quote above is that the body that organs inserted in the same functional place as the ego, uh, where the ego would normally reside. So Deleuze and Guattari preserve the structure of the unconscious and conceive it and supplement it with a few uh, conceptual inventions of their own, the body that organs being one such invention. And what I've tried to show is that the body that organs becomes apparent in those situations Freud described as occasions of ego loss, this being his sense of what happens in the extremes of schizophrenic delirium. It is this sense a symptom of schizophrenia, but not a product of schizophrenia. The body that organs is what stands beneath the ego, the thin line separating the ego from the id, which Freud says is permeable, but more or less distinct. The body that organs is what remains, then after the ego is gone, and after it has disintegrated, but, as should be clear from the quote above, it is no mere ruin. In fact, it continues to defend the possibility of an ego by holding back the id and maintaining a place where the ego might come into being once again. By the same token, in the ego's absence, it is also perfectly able to rise up and take its place and serve as the subject's organising centre. It is for this reason that Deleuze and Guattari's uh, conception of a therapeutic form of psychoanalysis begins with the body that organs. When I quoted Deleuze saying that Lawrence painted a picture in words of the body that organs, it should now be understood in conclusion that what Lawrence gave us is not the concept of the body that organs, but one of its productions. His fantasias of the unconscious are precisely examples of the world seen through the lens of the body that organs rather than the ego. Thank you. paper is to, um, I thought, given that it was a, a postgraduate conference, um, that I would uh, give a talk around a pedagogical question. Um, I'm often asked about the relationship between Deleuze and his various source materials, and this is one of the questions that uh, 
uh, as a supervisor of PhD projects, I get asked a lot, um, and also just by various people who email me. Uh, so philosophical materials, scientific materials, creative materials, historical, archaeological, uh, and so on. Um, usually by students wanting to know how much of that vast and utterly eclectic background reading they ought to do. The answer I generally give is the rather ambiguous one that sometimes it can help, but sometimes it doesn't. I'm generally ambivalent about the idea that reading everything Deleuze himself supposedly read will provide an answer to the larger question of what he himself meant in his writing, uh, and I'll try to say why. Now, I should just clarify when I say supposedly read on Into the Other. Now, in a paper um, that will come out in a book later this year, I believe, um, by a Belgian scholar by the name of Annaline Macheline, um, she writes and puzzles, I think, quite fruitfully about the relationship between Deleuze and D.H. Lawrence. Now, without specifically formulating it as a question, she calls our attention to the problematic way in which Deleuze deals with Lawrence. As she points out, Deleuze is simultaneously a close, careful, and obviously knowledgeable reader of Lawrence, or then again, he was married to somebody who was a close and attentive reader of Lawrence. Um, so again, we don't know how attentive he was. Um, as well as highly selective and subtly distorting and even a negligent reader of Lawrence. He not only ignores the great novels, uh, Sons and Lovers, Women in Love, The Rainbow, uh, and Lady Chatterley's Lover. He also ignores Lawrence's, uh, and I quote here, misogynistic attacks on, on modern women and his peculiar ideas on the education of children. He favours instead the critical and psychological work such as Psychoanalysis and the Unconscious and its sequel, Fantasia of the Con Unconscious. He looks at studies in classical American literature and more distantly, the essays in the posthumous collection Phoenix. He makes occasional mention of minor novels, minor novels like Aaron's Rod and novellas such as The Plumed Serpent, but as Macheline rightly observes, these references are always ambiguous in their systematic method. You can actually make sense of it. So I've always thought that you should read What is Philosophy as a kind of reader's guide to all the prior material. And the first thing that they say, which I think is critical, is that they distinguish quite rigorously between scientific discourse, artistic discourse, and um, philosophical discourse. Now, I'm using discourse in the sort of Foucauldian sense as a kind of shorthand here. It's very clear that he does not regard these discourses to be interchangeable. He allows that they can interfere with one another productively, but he rules out their interchange. Scientists produce reference, not concepts. The actual word Deleuze uses is functive, but the function of a functive is to provide reference, so I'm going to call them reference rather than functives because it's, I think, a, a, a fairly silly word. Um, so scientists produce reference, not concepts. Artists produce affects and percepts, not concepts. Only philosophers produce concepts. And while these may borrow from reference and from percepts and affects and so on, they are not the same thing. So, for example, when Delunder uses science to ground Deleuze's ontology, he transforms concepts into reference, which is precisely not what Deleuze himself wanted. By the same token, when various readers of Deleuze assume that Artaud is the source of the concept of the body that organs, they mistake a percept for a concept and forget that Deleuze defined artistic works as pre-philosophical. Second, taking this into account, what we have to try to determine is just what is the difference between a concept and a referent and a percept, or rather, since in a way we know the difference, what the question then is what work goes on in transforming the latter, reference and percepts, into the former, namely concepts. To begin with, there has to be a kind of subtraction. Concepts are less referential than reference. Their ontology is less realist, to use Delunder's term, Concepts are less perceptive than percepts. But in taking away, they must also perform an addition. So concepts might be less referential than reference, but they are more able to deal with complexity because they aren't constrained by the same rules of empirical proof. Concepts might be less perceptive than percepts, but in a way they enable us to see more than percepts do because they aren't constrained by the limits of the material one has to work with in art. So what I'm trying to say is they're not the same thing and what we have to do in trying to figure out how to 
work out the relationship is to look at the process of transformation of one. I was talking to Patricia about this earlier on, but one of the things that has come out uh, more recently is that in the aftermath of Antietipus and before the writing of A Thousand Plateaus, this is a moment when Deleuze and Guattari are, are famous, um, but also they're teaching together at Vincennes, and loads of students come to the... If you've seen some of the videos on YouTube and so forth, you see that their, their seminar rooms are jam-packed. I mean, they're literally people sitting right next to Deleuze sort of looking at his notes and that sort of thing. Um, but the students are bringing stuff to them and bringing big chunks of text from all kinds of places and saying, you've got to read this, you've got to read this. Who knows how much of that stuff Deleuze actually read, but certainly there's a kind of collective project going on in producing that book, uh, which, for me, renders questionable and makes it problematic uh, in the sense of something that we should think about, the nature of his relationship to this material. Okay. Now, first, I think we need to take seriously Deleuze's differentiation between philosophical, scientific and artistic discourses in What is Philosophy. Now, it's quite interesting that the final book that they write together is What is Philosophy, in which almost, I think deliberately, they set out a program of how one should read the, all the previous books. And this book kind of comes at the end and saying, OK, look, we've written all this crazy stuff, but if you follow 